Uh, I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here. Just one of the pastors here. But, but I know this. Like, all of us really care and we get excited about people's spiritual growth. We just want to see that more and more and more. Uh, you, you know, the gospel is so simple. A child can understand it. Right? But it's so intricately beautiful that we'll spend the rest of our lives understanding, experiencing, and working out the implications of the gospel. So we're never done with it. Yet I'm guessing that most of us struggle with this. We mostly don't intend to do what's bad. So like we don't wake up in the morning and think, how can I disobey God today? Or we don't pray, Lord, how can I make that person pay for what they did to me? Sin for sure is behavior. It's acting in our own power and strength. A way the, against the way that God has, has set up life to be lived and prescribed life to be lived. So like Jonah, you know, God, you want me to do that? Nope, ain't doing that. Opposite direction. We actively choose disobedience to God. But sin is more than just behavior. Sin flows from a heart and mind that's marred from sin as well. So a little bit of history... In the 11th century, the, the ancient Christian Thomas Aquinas, one of the doctors of the church, elaborated on the categories of sin under broad headings. And maybe some of you, have you grown up, are familiar with the seven deadly sins. Attitudes of the heart, pride, greed, or covetousness, lust, or as Aquinas called it, luxury which is an over-desire for pleasure, and then envy, gluttony, wrath or anger, sloth or laziness. So Aquinas and those who followed believe that these seven deadly sins, uh, or these seven sins were deadly, absolutely deadly to the soul, in the sense that as they come out of people, they don't help people become more human, uh, like God created them to be. In fact, when these vices come out of us, right, that they really make us lousy people in life. These internal attitudes of the heart show up in our behavior, but they uh, begin in the heart. And when they leak out of us, we tend to run into brick walls because we aren't living in reality the way that God created reality to be lived. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. There's just a way that God has created life to be lived, called reality. So this is where Jonah 4 comes in. As I've reflected and read chapter 4 over and over, many of these seven deadly sins, these internal heart attitudes, leak out of Jonah. Uh, Martin Luther once wrote that the life of a Christian is one of repentance, not just from the bad things that we do, but even from the good things that we do. We must repent from the good things that we do because, more often than not, the source of motivation for these good behaviors is often these internal attitudes, these seven sins that reside in the heart still. For instance, how much of our good religious behavior is wrapped up in wanting to promote ourselves before God or others so that we can feel better? about ourselves and about other people. The ancient Christians didn't hold back any, pull back any, any punches, right? They call this spiritual pride. They talked about very spiritual things that we do, but when it's linked to the vices, it becomes something ugly. Spiritual pride is not a good thing. In other words, even under our, our good behavior, good spiritual behavior, is a curving in on ourselves in pride. That's what Luther said as well. There is no major or minor prophet in the Bible who is described as dysfunctionally as Jonah was. There is no other prophet. And so, man, that's a lot of sin inside of Jonah. And he was a prophet of God. Well, if that's the case, what about us? 
All of us who have been up in front have spoken about the second chance that Jonah was given. And it's clear that in this second chance, something should have become clear to him. And it should become clear to us. So to review the book, chapter 1 through chapter 3, Jonah, communi- uh, Jonah the book is communicated efficiently, effectively in four short chapters. Progressing from God's initial call to Jonah and preach to the Assyrians and Ninevites, right, of impending judgment if they continue in their evil ways, to God, Jonah running from God and then repenting in the belly of a fish. And then finally, as Steve noted last week, Jonah getting a second chance to go to Nineveh. And he noted, the people turned from their wickedness. And that's where I think we'd like the story to be done. A nice little bow wrapped on it. It's neat. It's resolved. However, chapter 4 is... Uh, It's the surprise ending. And that surprise ending makes this, I think, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I love it. There is ample grace for other people as we're sent on mission. But there is another grace, another grace given by God. Maybe a more personal grace to us to experience. So let's begin to read chapter 4. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to God, please, Lord, isn't this what I said when I was still in my country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. We see four things. Jonah's heart, God's intervention, God's heart, and the real Jonah. So let's begin by taking a look at Jonah's heart. Now we begin to see why Jonah fled from God in the first place. When the Ninevites repented, he became furious or raging with anger. Have you ever gotten super angry over something? you're anything like me, when you've calmed down, you've thought, whoa, that was excessive. Where did that anger come from? (coughs) Anger is always a reaction to something deeper inside of us. So what exactly is anger then? Well, the old Christians saw wrath or anger as a passion that could be good and right, or incredibly destructive to those around you and to your own soul. Simply put, anger is love's response to deal with a threat to something or someone near to your heart. If something you really love is threatened, you get angry. So think of when you were angry over something that happened to one of your family members. There is a kind of anger that can be expressed in the right way. So now I hope that we can see why the Bible speaks of God becoming angry when he sees how destructive sin is and how we treat other people, taking what's good in creation and making it ugly. Naturally, he gets angry at what sin does to people. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, I prefer a God of love, not a God of anger. Remember that love and anger are always connected. If you have a God of love who never gets angry, well, what kind of God are you left with then? In fact, I'm going to suggest that justice makes no sense if God isn't angry about sin. With any person, including God, anger is always connected to what they love. And because God loves us, he's justified in getting angry at how destructive sin is in our life. While God's anger is always expressed in the right way, toward the right thing, always with the right amount of passion, our anger is often 
distorted. Further, our anger has a spectrum from mild frustration to hot anger, from devaluing another person, contempt, loathing, irritation, to violent outbursts. And here's the key, man. We often disguise anger so it looks nice. Because, boy, Christians shouldn't be angry, should they? Right? You have to look presentable to people. But deep inside, all of the anger that I mentioned, that is an internal kind of something going on inside of us. St. Augustine wrote in The City of God that internal sin turns the love that we have for good things uh, in this life, like the earthly kingdom, right, into a disordered mess. So there are many things that are good in our lives. Your family, your job, your boat, a societal issue, your country. But when those things become central things and are threatened or taken away or access to them is frustrated, we get angry. Another way to put what Augustine was saying is this. Our out of our out of order loves creates out of order anger. Our disordered loves creates disordered anger. Now maybe it's not anger in losing tangible things, but it can we often get angry because we lose control or the status quo. We like things just Right? Don't change, don't change, don't change. So now, when you see Jonah's anger, and you see how cloudy his heart was, for instance, did it strike you as odd in verse 3 that Jonah said that God's character is gracious, compassionate, he's slow to anger, and full of a love that won't quit? Jonah is quoting scripture like a good Jew because this is repeatedly how God described himself in the scriptures. The irony is he knew God was slow to anger and yet excessive anger came out of him. How excessive? When asked if anger is a, was a good thing, he said, I'm so mad, I'd rather die. That's some serious anger. The question is, in Jonah's anger, what was he protecting then? What did he love so much that the threat of losing it made him so mad? Jonah was angry because he was clinging to something that every Jew held precious. As Assyria, right, capital of Nineveh, or Nineveh was the capital, as Assyria was a mortal enemy of God, well, God, what about our security as your people. How can you give grace to such a violent, wicked, evil people? Where is your wrath that justice demands? Our nation is special. We're a nation based on your undying commitment, love, and grace. Well, never mind this, Jonah, that in Genesis 12, Abraham was promised that his descendants would be blessed in order to be a blessing to the nations. Not only is Jonah reflecting a deep racial prejudice, but he seems to be drawing a boundary around grace. Jonah's love of security for his people led him to greedily safeguard God's grace. So is one's love for their nation a good thing? Absolutely. Yes, it's a good thing. But when it becomes excessive, that's when everything becomes disordered and everything else gets pushed to the side. Tim Keller in his book on Jonah wrote, their identity uh, is more rooted in their race and nationality than in being saved sinners and children of God. And so if you want elaboration on this, the second half of Keller's book is insightful. It's marvelous. When God and his word are used to justify a country-centered, nationalistic pride, an angry, snarky self-righteousness spreads like a cancer that rots the soul. That's Jonah's heart. I want you to see God's intervention. 
the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? Just like that. Is it right for you to be angry? Some older translations read, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? The Lord is asking Jonah if his anger is appropriate. Is it the right kind of anger toward the right thing with the right amount of emotion or passion or strength? If you think, Jonah, that you went to the depths of the belly of that fish, let's go to the depth of your heart. In God's continued grace and patience, the Lord took Jonah into therapy to uncover really what was underneath. Underneath his disobedience and anger. God knew what was there, but he was trying to draw Jonah's heart out. And notice the Lord intervened graciously. He didn't get angry with Jonah. Just as he graciously steered disobedient Jonah in the right direction and graciously saved him from the fish, he gave grace to Jonah to search his own heart. Kurt read from Psalm 139 this morning. Let me read from verse 23 and 24. Right? Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my concern. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. This grace that God gives serves as a mirror to us to offer a reflection of our own heart. When the anger gets going, you're going to see a mirror come up in your life. It should come up. Why are you so angry? Why are you so lazy? Why are you so envious? Why are you so gluttonous about wanting more, more pie? What's going on in your heart? Let's keep reading. Well, Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the, city, uh, that attacked the plant and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, just like this, it's better for me to die than to live. And then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. Man, talk about drama, <laughs> right? He's not a diva. I guess he'd be a devo. Is that right? <laughs> when God asked Jonah the first time in verse 4 if he was right to be so angry, shockingly, Jonah walked away, didn't answer. He was convinced that he was right and God was wrong. He left and he put himself in the shade of, of a shelter overlooking the city. And while he was still hoping for God's judgment and some fireworks show to begin. And then God provided an object lesson with a plant that grew overnight and provided Jonah's head with some shade. And that made Jonah happy and comfortable. I like this. Whether there really is a plant that can grow overnight or whether God just caused it to grow overnight, Jonah was providing, or God was providing Jonah with an object lesson. When a hot wind blew, and the plant died suddenly, Jonah became angry again. In his pride, he lusted or overloved his comfort in the shade. So when it was removed, he blew up again. Huh. Why does God intervene? By sometimes removing our comfort so that we can, by His grace, see how deep those habit-formed vestiges of sin reside in our hearts. What erupts out of you when comfort is gone? A mirror comes up. That's your heart. That's your heart. Jonah shocks us like an immature child who refuses to clean up their room when asked. See, there's a child's way to pout. But there's also a Jonah form of pouting when we don't get what we want. 
Oh, we don't stomp our feet and wear the big frown, but how many times have we been disappointed with God and then shut him out? Like, if you're not going to answer my prayer, God, I'm done. Like, talk to the hand, right? I'm done with you. I quit. Anger is not just a passionate outburst. It's also the passion of withholding relationship. Anger punishes others, either by lashing out or withholding relationship. The mirror comes up slowly to show you your own heart. So let's take a look at God's heart. Let's keep reading. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left or their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. The contrast is this. Jonah, look at your heart. And now here's mine. Spiritual maturity is not simply doing the right things. Biblically, spiritual maturity is aligning your heart with God's heart. That's the beginning of spiritual maturity. Let me say that again. Spiritual maturity is not simply just doing the right things. Biblically, spiritual maturity comes by taking your heart and knitting it with God's heart. So that what he wants you to do, you do with joy. The word that Jonah used earlier in verse 3 to describe God was, God, you, you have faithful love. That's the Hebrew word hesed. There's no simple English translation because there's such a rich meaning behind it. It's something like uh, an undying, an utterly undying loyal commitment where one pours out love on another not based on their ability to reciprocate. So I'm going to say that again. It's like, a, like an utterly undying loyal commitment where one pours out their love on another, not based on the other person's ability to reciprocate. The Hebrew word is equivalent to the Greek word grace. Grace is meant to change us. And so there are two things about grace I want to draw out. The first thing is this. Grace is absolutely promiscuous. Meaning it's God's grace that's available to everyone. Pastor Josh said this a couple, a couple weeks ago, that God's grace is promiscuous. He's not the soup Nazi who proclaims, no grace for you, one year. <laughs> God's grace is utterly amazing. And you and I don't get to determine who gets his grace and who doesn't. <laughs> Secondly, God's grace is prodigal. What I mean is when we sing the reckless love of God, it's not reckless in the sense that he's impulsively given out grace randomly. We, we church folk have certain ideas about the word prodigal. Our first thought might be to connect it with Jesus' parable that he told, right? About the prodigal son. It's been called the prodigal son. Somehow, our focus has been on the foolish younger son who took his family's inheritance early and squandered it, living a wild, unrestrained life. The word prodigal means liberality or wasteful extravagance. The story of the, the parable of the prodigal son is a story really about the father. Not the younger son who was lost in his pride and in this sort of wild behavior. Nor was it the older son who was lost in his prideful rule keeping as he looked down on his brother as because he was the good son who stayed home. We should call the parable the prodigal of or the story of the prodigal father and his two stupid sons. 
It's, a, it's the Father who is truly prodigal as His grace and mercy and love and forgiveness toward both sons seems wastefully extravagant. We have this strange relationship with grace, don't we? Initially, I think we're amazed at just how prodigal God's grace is. His grace is scandalously promiscuous and prodigal. How could he invite me, a sinner, to experience relationship with him? How could he forgive me completely and invite me into an eternal kind of life? Listen, can I be really honest with you? I've, I've tried to plumb some of the depths of some really hard questions facing Christianity. I think they're good questions. But I'm not stuck on the presence of evil and suffering in this life. I'm not stuck on election and free will. I'm stuck on this. Why? How could God even think it'd be a good thing for him to invite me, a knucklehead, into his kingdom? What, is he, what was he thinking? What, what is it about me that, I, right? Like, I don't know. I don't know. The experience of grace is meant to utterly change us. And initially it does, I think. But it doesn't take long before we start taking grace for granted and start telling God how to run his business. Oh, I know better than you, God, about my life. Oh, this issue right here? No. Like society has a much better take on it than you do, God. We all have pockets in our heart where we don't think God is enough. We don't think his love is enough. His grace really changed, really changed us initially. But does it continue to do so? Do you sit sometimes with a sense of emotion, overwhelmed by how great God is, that he could shower you with such loving kindness and continue to do so? even in the depth of your sin that's in your heart, and it often remains hidden to you, if you and I saw how much sin was in us, these vices, you would crawl up in a fetal position. It would kill you. If God is so full of grace, then, why shouldn't he care for Nineveh? Why can't he care for Nineveh? The city had over 120,000 people who didn't know the right hand from their left hand. That's just a poetic way of saying that they were spiritually lost. Back then, the average population of a walled city was 3,000 people. So that made Nineveh a huge city. And then when we read something strange, as well as many animals, and we think, what? Yes, God loves animals. But I believe it means that. I believe that it means that he cares for the economy of the city. In those days, the economy was agrarian or it was built around farming communities. God is not only concerned with souls, but he's concerned about the peace of the city, the shalom of the city, because he wants people to flourish. As Augustine wrote in The City of God, our care and concern for the earthly city is right, but it's only in light of the eternal city that we know is coming. Some translations say Jonah was compassionate toward the plant. Now, compassion is a really strong emotion where we voluntarily attach our heart to something else as we're deeply moved by their condition, problem, or trouble, so much so that, that we want to enter in, that we want to do something about it. God is saying, Jonah, you have compassion for a plant. I have compassion for the people of Nineveh. You pity a plant you lost. You pity the shade you lost. I pity the condition of lost people. Jonah, don't you see that just as I was compassionate toward you, I have that same level of emotional attachment to those who don't know their way. 
I want to enter into that. The same compassion, grace, love, and mercy I gave to you, I want to give to the Ninevites. I'm willing to suspend judgment so they might have an invitation to repent. And so this leaves us with a question. If evil demands God's justice, yes, he could judge Nineveh to rid the world of evil. But that would also mean that he would also have to judge Jonah. If God were to judge evil and remove it, who would be left standing? Jonah points to the real Jonah. We who live on this side of the cross know that there was one who was like Jonah, who was called to preach the good news of God's love and grace to a rebellious and stubborn people. Instead of running the opposite way, he obeyed God and he went. You see, there was one like Jonah who fell asleep on a boat in the middle of a raging storm and he had to be woken up. There was one like Jonah who would be swallowed up for three days, but this time by sin and death. The first Jonah was angry that God extended love, grace, and mercy to an undeserving people. But the second Jonah, when people rejected him and his teaching with utter anger and hate, what came out of his heart? Not the vice of anger, but compassion as he attached himself to us. He entered in, offering forgiveness. The first Jonah was spared from death. But the ultimate Jonah, Jesus, was not spared. He willingly gave his life as a sacrifice for our redemption, forgiveness, love, mercy, grace, life itself. In the story of Jonah, judgment was suspended. But for the greater Jonah, Jesus, judgment was poured out on him. At the cross, he experienced God's wrath that we deserve so that our hearts then could be open to his love. The cross is where God's justice and his love meet. The book of Jonah drops its readers off wondering how Jonah responded. It's wonderful writing. It's just marvelous. This is an imaginative and poignant way of getting every reader, including us, to ask the question, how will I respond? So here's some questions. What about your heart? Do you take grace for granted? (laughs) We can want others to change. We can want our society to change. What about you? What about you? Why are you so lacking in character change? For all the time that you spend complaining about what's out there, are you willing to be as ruthless about what's in here? For all the complaining, the time that we spend complaining about what's out there, Are we willing to spend as much time being as ruthless about what's in here? It's only the grace that you and I have received because of Jesus' work that even allows us to be honest about our own sin, knowing that we won't be rejected. Psalmist foreshadowed this when he wrote about our utter forgiveness as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sin from us. What Jesus has done is incredibly good news. And that is worth sharing and letting that sink deeply into the crevices of your heart so that you'll live it out.